Looks like we're live, huh, Holly? Yeah, let's go ahead and get started, William. Okay. Hey, thanks everybody for tuning in. We're trying a new platform this week. Uh, we officially broke GoToWebinar last week and uh, thought we were going to have 8,000 people show up and they only let 1,000 in and we kind of fired them. So we're trying something new. Uh, we're doing Zoom to Facebook Live. And uh, this week, I'm really excited. It was fun, super fun to have pastors from some of the largest churches in the country uh, visit with us last week about what they're looking at. And, and they're going to be some of the last rooms to reopen, right? But today, we want to talk about what's a much more normal setting. Like, what's a normal church like? So today, we've got uh, churches that some might call midsize, some might call, oh, that's still really big. But some might say, no, that's more normal. And I thought we'd go around the the horn. I've had the pleasure of getting to know most everybody on the call, uh, but uh, let's just go around real fast. And, and on my screen, John, you're right next to me. So John, introduce yourself and where you're serving and how long you've been there. Sure. Uh, John Ridner. I uh, have pastored in a mega church context and planted micro churches in Europe. And now I serve in Hollywood, California uh, at a church called Ecclesia. We have about uh, 250 to 280 adults uh, kind of in our orbit, and then another 80 to 90 kids all under the age of 13. So uh, that puts an uh, average Sunday attendance around 200 plus. Uh, we rent a facility in Hollywood, and um, I've been here be five years this summer, thanks to Van Bloomen. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Leonce, tell us about yeah. yourself. Yeah, Pastor Leonce Crump, uh, founding pastor of Renovation Church. My wife and I planted Renovation just about 10 years ago in downtown Atlanta. Uh, we're a church of 800 to 1,000 uh, with respect to adults and another couple hundred kids, and uh, it's been a fun ride. So, uh, you know, Atlanta's a strange and interesting place, uh, but we love it here. And, and John, your church uh, grew out of a Presbyterian church, but it is non-denominational, right? Correct. Yep. Presbyterian polity came out of Hollywood Presbyterian about uh, 13 years ago. Which used to have the used to be the largest church in America years and years yeah, ago. The 30s and 40s, one of the first kind of commuter mega churches in the country. Yep. Yeah, pretty amazing. And Lance, you're mo you're quite recently a Presbyterian, right? Reluctantly so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be, Lance. Uh, and Jim, tell us about your setting. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jim Gribnitz. I'm the lead pastor out at Rockland Community Church out in um, just west of Denver. So we're, um, I moved from uh, uh, Dallas and we have family in Houston. I worked at a, a Baptist church of about 3000 or so on a Sunday in student ministry and then a, a church of Presbyterian church about 1500 or so. And, um, and now I'm at a church of about, we have about 400, 425, something like that over a couple services on a Sunday. Um, skews a little bit older demographic. We're in the suburbs. We're from Denver. We're towards the ski slopes. Um, and so it's a little, little wealthier um, kind of community, which I'm pretty used to. That's where I've, I've, uh, I've been serving. Um, came out of the UCC. We're a non-denominational church, very tight-knit um, community and a real intergenerational church. So our kids and students, um, we used to have them pretty separate and we're, and we're really, um, bringing them together. It's a very, it's a very community friendly kind of church. So, so if you grew up Presbyterian or if you grew up not Baptist and you've had a Coors beer and on the front is a waterfall, uh, you're kind of like right next door to that, right? We are, we're, we're, we're in Coors country out here. We have some of the Coors that have been to our church and things like that as well. Some of that, some of the family and a lot of people have worked there. That's great. Matt, introduce yourself and tell us about where you are. Thanks. I'm Matt Waterstone. I'm the senior minister of the Reformed Church of Bronxville in Lower Westchester, uh, New York. Uh, so when COVID-19 broke out, uh, the first city in the country, New Rochelle, was uh, the city that was on like the full quarantine. And if you remember the news, they, they drew that circle. So that circle touched Bronxville. So that's the town right next over. So we're, we're really sort of at the epicenter of it. Uh, the Reformed Church of Bronxville uh, has probably about 700 people on their rolls, but if you know anything about sort of the way church works on, on sort of the Northeast, uh, you know, we probably have about 350 to 400 between a few services uh, in attendance on Sunday. Um, so thanks and welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, sure. Sure. And Lillian, last but not least. 
Hi, I'm Lillian Daniel, Senior Minister at uh, First Congregational Church in Dubuque, Iowa. And before that, I've served churches in New Haven, Connecticut, and also the suburbs of Chicago, and uh, came to Iowa in 2016. And contrary to what people think, when you imagine where I am, I'm not in the middle of a field, a cornfield, but actually in a very urban setting, downtown in Dubuque, right on the Mississippi. So we got all kinds of, as we talk about reopening church, we have very different contexts. Uh, Leon's the, the woman that cuts my hair, I think is moving to Atlanta so she can open up her shop because y'all are open sooner than everybody else. And then we've got poor Matt that's still stuck in the epicenter of things. And what I'd like to do today, uh, as much as we can just talk tactically, like really practical stuff, uh, I'd love to hear from you all. And I'd like to start with Lillian. And Lillian, tell us a little bit that you, you've had this interesting um, juxtaposition of having people gathered as a feeding center, but you can't gather together as a church. So tell us what, what you guys have been doing to try and work toward reopening and what you've been doing with the feeding center in the, in the midst of all that. Absolutely. So our congregation is very diverse economically from CEOs to, to people who are homeless. And we do a free dinner on Thursday nights. Well, obviously that's no longer um, putting 200 people in, into a crowded room. You know, we're doing it to go and take out. But we also locked down our sanctuary so that we could keep um, videotaping the services. And so um, we're both interacting with the public on the one level, like feeding people, but then our parishioners, you know, we're not interacting with. So it's a, it's a strange place to be in when you're in urban church, you're also kind of like a quasi nonprofit uh, providing other things like food and nobody else is going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you just show of hands are preaching from your church right now? Okay, okay. And John's just preaching from right there. Yeah. <laughs> I would also say too, you know, we're in the quote unquote breadbasket of America, but I can tell you that food is gonna become the, the next big crisis, particularly around meat. And um, in Iowa, I feel like for us, the pain that we're feeling is not so much the virus, but the economic pain right now. I think the pain of the health concerns is gonna come later, um, but we've got, you know, uh, hog farmers who are going to have to shoot pigs um, because they can't get processed because the virus is spreading in the processing centers. And then you got a hungry world and hungry people right in the city. Wow. Wow. So, uh, Lance, when are you, you going to have services again? You guys are the first state to open, that, by my knowledge. What, what, what are you thinking? Um, so, yeah, we are not uh, opening anytime soon. Okay. The, the city of Atlanta has taken a very different approach uh, than the governor. And I think it's a wise approach. Uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms uh, is very data-driven in her approach. And so uh, we're gonna follow the lo more local guidelines than we do uh, the state guidelines. So I, I suspect we're looking at it late summer. Uh, late summer, okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, here's the primary thing, William, is, you know, church of 200, church of 800, you know, we, we kind of ran the numbers and to do six to 10 feet in a, in a worship gathering puts me at seven to eight services yeah. uh, a day. Uh, so is that feasible and is it wise? Uh, and is it, you know, is it the right type of public health risk? Can I take everybody's temperature on the way? And you know, here's some of the practical things that we thought through taking temperatures, wiping down, you know, having family units, together, but separated from the other people in the room, uh, you know, there's just not really a feasible way uh, to, to try and go immediately back to gathering. So we have put together kind of a phasing plan. Ah, uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, really looking toward the late summer to start uh, some house parties. Uh, so uh, rather than having our digital gatherings just be viewed by individual family units, start to gather people in larger gatherings in their homes to, to worship together digitally uh, as things ebb and flow. And then moving from those house parties uh, to three to four larger gatherings once the social distancing guidelines change according to the CDC. And then hopefully uh, some sort of new normal toward the fall. Interesting. I was watching uh, uh, 
the Surratt brothers, you know, there's a million of them, if you know. There are a million. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Uh, but they had a, a webinar not recently, not too long ago, and they said uh, they're in, so Seacoast is a big, big, big church in Charleston and all around South Carolina. And they said, we're going to encourage watch parties of 10 because we can do that now. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to ask the groups of 10 to find four other groups of 10 when we can go to 50 and we have groups of 50 get together. And then um, they haven't said it out loud, but I know a lot of churches in Seacoast, one of them is thinking probably we're going to do services on Saturday and Sunday because the whole staying six feet apart, I mean, you can't, how many people can you put in your room? So yeah. any of you thought about offering services on Saturday or Sunday, Matt, what, what are you, are you guys even thinking about going to church? No, <laughs> no, not, not at the current moment. I think one thing that we're, we're acknowledging is that, you know, they're just because, uh, and we're going to take our cues from, from state and local guidelines, but just because those guidelines say one thing, the actual level of comfort within the congregation may be completely different. And so just because we say, we would say, uh, we're, we're going to have church, uh, you know, the first Sunday of June uh, and anticipate that everyone's going to come back is, is just not going to happen. Um, so, you know, we're just, we're trying to leave space and be comfortable not having all the answers. We want to try to plan to the best of our ability, but yet we realize we're calling audibles all the time, especially this time of year when we have so many sort of things like, you know, the, you need to recognize the church school teachers and you want to have senior send off Sunday and, and all these sort of traditions, you know, we're just sort of realizing it, they may happen this year. They may not happen this year. They may look differently. Uh, but at this point, I mean, we're certainly closed through, uh, through May, through the month of May, and then we'll look to see what happens in, in June. But just because we are allowed to I think we're all under the assumption that we likely won't be back sort of together, certainly until, uh, as Leon shared, late summer. Let's just keep going around the horn with that question. John, what's your what's your forecast for Hollywood and for a church that's uh, are pretty close to that 200 number on a Sunday? Yeah, you know, if you followed any of the national news, you know that California has been kind of one of the most aggressive and cons maybe conservative or aggressive in dealing with this, kind of first to shut down. So I, I would expect us to probably be one of the last to open uh, in the same way. But I think as you've been reading, um, you know, a lot of this kind of step up approach of groups of 25, groups of 50, groups of 100. The, the challenge, and Leonce is saying it, is, you know, um, even in our space, we rent a Seventh-day Adventist church. We have it Sunday mornings. We don't really have the opportunity to do something Saturday. So we would, if we wanted to gather, it would have to be in that time slot Sunday morning. Um, you couldn't really have any kids program. There's no social distancing for kids, maybe below second or third grade. Um, we don't have the space to expand that. So you're looking at a family unit. We have some family units that are likely on six people. Um, is, is that what they want to do to work? Is that a worshipful environment to come sit with a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, you know, and your spouse and wear your mask and stay six feet apart and try to sing to the Lord and keep your kids? It's not what they are longing for right now. What they're looking for more is community, face-to-face, -face, 3D connection, not maybe that large group worship experience. So I think when I've made phone calls to parents, they're not itching to say, hey, I can't wait to get back into a building with just my family, what they're saying is what I would love to do is get back together in a couple homes and things like that. So we're, we're thinking similarly of kind of that step up approach of home gatherings, regional gatherings around LA. Uh, and then, and then if we probably not coming back to a congregational gathering, honestly, until we could gather normally. Um, yeah. So that, that may change, but that's kind of what we're thinking right now. I just can't imagine um, us being in that room with all the limitations and it feeling very worshipful. I think we're, people are in, enjoying what we're doing right now. And if we do start to gather, it may be not around a worship experience, but much more around a community experience. Interesting. Jim, how about you guys? Yeah. Are you asking about if we're, if we looked at doing something on Saturday? Yeah. 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 And when you think you're going to see it open? Yeah, so so we're in Colorado with a few different challenges. Um, we have a I don't, I don't know if this is national. We have a stay at home order through May. I think it's first, and then there's a safer at home order 
that would go into effect. I think it's starting May 9th, something like that, which is basically like, everybody, please stay at home. But we're not technically not a stay at home order anymore. Um, the other, one of the challenges we have is um, there was a church, there was one in Colorado Springs I just heard about, and there was one in our community that basically said, hey, we're Christians, we we don't answer to the government, kind of, we probably know, all know churches that have th- sort of thought that. Um, there's one right over here, and they started meeting, and they basically just ignored the order, um, which no one asked my opinion about it, but whatever. But they're doing that, and one of the things I noticed is our community where we are was very quick to go on social media and just lambast them, this little tiny church, um, but where we are, the community loves getting online, loves getting on Nextdoor and Facebook and stuff and and just kind of tearing into them. And so one of the challenges that we have here in particular, because we have some people that are going, we're ready to come back. Let's, you know, let's go. And then um, others that I just talked to yesterday that aren't, that are saying, well, I don't know when we're going to be back. And they're all along that spectrum. And then we add this other layer of we have a witness to the community. And so even if the borders get lifted, what do we actually do and so the two things that that we've been doing is we've just said can we just sort of keep putting this off until more and more data gets in so we're not doing anything through uh, may 9th i think is the when the stay-at-home order officially ends i can't fathom coming back before or real soon after that Um, but the other thing we're doing is we're engaging a lot of people in the community in the conversation because otherwise i filter it through my mindset or the latest person that I talk to or two people on the elder board or whatever it is. And I'm really trying to get a feel for what is our community sensing and see if God would confirm it through all of us. So um, we're, we do things in the sanctuary. We broadcast them now. Um, we'll probably, I could see us doing, I like the house party thing. I may just steal your, your word there too. That sounds way cooler than anything we were going to call it. Um, just like have, have, small groups like meeting in the church and, and doing the worship service that way would probably be our phased in approach that we're going to look at. Yeah, we, we have seven kids. So we, in most countries, we would be illegal as a house because they're yeah. too many of us. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So, so Lillian, I haven't asked you, when do you think you all will gather for worship? I'd agree with what others are saying. It's a real wait and see. What, what I'd hate to do is come in too early and then have to go back out. That right. would be a nightmare. I find myself uh, reluctant as a follower of Jesus to have a scenario where like one group is invited and the other isn't. That seems very difficult to imagine for me right now. Um, so, you know, how do you do it at a time where you can invite everybody back and do it safely? I, I am open to a Saturday service and things like that. What I think we're going to see, though, is whenever this happens, we're not going to be packed. People are going to trickle in and trickle out. And I think that they're still going to rely on the technological stuff that we've learned in this crisis, and they're not going to want that to go away. So I can see a scenario where in some ways, you know, people ask me like, well, what are you doing these days as a pastor? And I feel like I've never worked harder. I've never been busier. Um, But I think once we have that going back in, we'll be even busier because we'll be trying to do both. Mm -hmm. And there'll be that expectation. Mm -hmm. see i am not a pastor so i'm totally unqualified to make the speculation but i think uh it will take a little while for people to get used to okay can i get in a big group but i think that the uh uh, was anybody a pastor after 9-11 lillian you were okay we're both old enough to know that one Uh, um we couldn't find enough chairs I mean, we were dragging chairs in from every room, you know, like everybody wanted to gather. The The need to to go to church in a crisis is just wired into us. And I think, you know, you hear uh, in the creation narrative, you hear God say, this is good, light, oh, that's good, and the animals, that's good, and people, oh, that's very good. And then the first thing he curses is he says, it's not good for you all to be alone. And so I... I think the combination of a craving to get together and <laughs> it doesn't take much reading the Old Testament to realize we're really quick to forget things that are dangerous for us. So like <laughs> we are a stiff necked people and I think we're pretty quickly people are like, oh, whatever. Uh, so I, 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 but I do think it'll be a, a both and thing. One thing that I'm asking myself is, so you, you open, uh, what in the world have, have any of you given thought to what you're going to do with children's ministry? 
and, and I shouldn't just ask open-ended, but somebody jump in and say, uh, we're not having children anymore or <laughs> like, well, what are you going to do yeah. with children? Yeah. Go, well, go well it, me and my wife aren't having children anymore, but I don't think that's what you're asking. Um, children's ministry at the church, I think, on the other hand, is um, we just had a conversation about vacation Bible school. And yeah. um, our philosophy right now is that people will probably come to something smaller before they'll come to something bigger. And especially like in my context, in the I was in the Bible Belt of big churches. I mean, you think in how do we have these big events and invite people and then they can get smaller from there. And it feels to me like the reality of it is someone would send their, um, so I'll speak for myself. I'd send my daughter to a an event for a handful of elementary girls that she knows but then if you go hey we're doing vbs and we'll have 100 something people at it as a parent i think what reality is you might go eh, and you might hesitate so we're, we're looking at um as far as that event goes we're looking at smaller um as opposed to bigger i, I can't speak to sunday mornings because we're really taking it week to week we don't know what that's going to look like but that's a general philosophy we're using that's awesome any other thoughts on children? Yeah, I, I think that's the same tension and feeling, you know, William, I, I agree with you. Our, our knee jerk in crises is to try to find solutions. Uh, even people who aren't believers, you know, they start to think in divine solutions because the, the scope of the problem gets bigger than they can get their hands. Oh. around. Oh. I, I think the tension I'm feeling in that though, is, you know, plague versus, you know, bombing. Right. So, you know, 9-11 was a unique challenge in that we had never been attacked like that on our own soil from a foreign hostile nation. And, and I, th I think there was a lot of nationalism blended with that faith response as well. Uh, but here we have, you know, a disease that uh, asymptomatic people can spread. Uh, my governor apparently just found that out two weeks before he decided to open up the state, but that's a different conversation. Uh, and he said that on national television. So I'm not coming after him. He said, I didn't even know asymptomatic people were uh, contagious. Let's open up in two weeks and let's start with, you know, barbershops, bowling alleys, and gyms because the most comfortable places are the places you want to open first. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, as far as kids' ministry, I, our team is thinking of it in the scope of the whole. You know, what will regular rhythms feel like again? Uh, and, and my wife and I, so I don't know if you guys are Enneagram people, but uh, I'm an eight. Uh, in fact, the, the person who administered our Enneagram said I was the 80th eight to ever eight. Uh, so my first response was, eh, this isn't a big deal. Everybody's freaking out over nothing. Like that was, that was literally my first response. And, my, and so we didn't pull our kids from daycare and we didn't, you know, freak out. And we, you know, um, but about a week into it, as I gathered data, because that eight goes to five under stressors, as I gathered data and started to kind of see the the, the exponential rise in this thing, it really gave us pause. And, and my wife's the same way. You know, we we were the last people to kind of pull our kids out of daycare uh, uh, because we were still working a lot and trying to figure out how to do it all together. So I think with respect to kids' ministry, I, I'm thinking it, of it in family units first. Uh, in smaller gatherings as opposed to larger gatherings first, and then really allowing the data to drive our response as a whole as best we can. And it's not going to be perfected. Uh, what I would hate to happen, and this did happen in Georgia, by the way, for those of you uh, who maybe haven't kept it up, but uh, a large majority of the deaths in Georgia related to COVID-19 have been churches and funerals. Mm -hmm. And and the outbreak in Albany, Georgia, which which is like the the one of the hottest spots in the country, was from two funerals and two church services, and so God forbid that you know we move too quickly and somebody contract this in our church and and there's a fatality related to it and then you know as Lillian was saying then we have a major setback because we've gone in too quick and now we got to go back out again, and uh, uh, I can't predict the future I definitely can't manipulate it. Uh, but I do want to be as wise as possible going forward. Well, there's silver linings in everything. Uh, the CDC's put together some guidelines that have not been reviewed by the White House yet, but it got, I think the Washington Post grabbed it. Maybe some of you guys saw this on the news this morning. But one of the recommendations for churches with CDC the, from the CDC is that there not be any more choirs. And as a senior pastor, I was like, yes, 
<laughs> don't have to deal with the choir anymore. So maybe there'll be a silver lining somewhere. But uh, hey, let me switch gears into, and Holly's got some good questions coming in. Uh, but uh, before we go to questions, let's talk about pastoral care. You know, in a church that's a normal sized church, the pastor is not just I'm the preacher and the head of staff. Like people want to see you when they're sick. How are you guys addressing pastoral care? Like Matt, you've got people in your church that are sick or scared or older. Have you have you been able to reach out to them? What are, what are you doing in a really hot hot spot to be the the shepherd in this moment? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're we're sort of overlaying all of this is is the question: What are we learning? What are we learning with respect to children's ministry? What are we learning about? our priorities as a church, what are the things that are the most important? And I think uh, two answers that are coming to the top of that question is really our corporate worshiping life, and then also how do we care for one another? Uh, and so, you know, I, I'll be honest, I spend um, a good part of my week uh, just replying to emails. And I think in some ways this this pandemic has really chipped away a little bit at the emotional exterior uh, of some Northeasterners that, that maybe don't like to get a little bit, you know, a little bit deeper in terms of koinonia and fellowship. And so this has really touched a chord in really opening up some deep emotional uh, kinds of issues that have been a wonderful on-ramp to electronically correspond over where it's not necessarily so confrontational and people can just sort of really share honestly with what they're thinking and how they're feeling. Uh, so yeah, a, a lot of email, a lot of phone calls, uh, you know, really practically early on, we divided out our congregation among our consistory members and had everyone make calls. Uh, so it was a great way to connect with people, but we also realized like how out of date our directory was, right? And, and how we, we need to do a better job of cleaning up and getting more accurate uh, phone numbers and cell phone numbers and things like that. Um, but yeah, phone, email, a lot of texting. Um, so we're also doing some Zoom pastoral care kinds of things and spiritual direction sorts of things one-on-one -on -one, and also some Zoom Bible studies uh, that sort of fall on the pastoral care side as well. See, I think uh, a pastor who's a good friend here in town is scared to death. He said, no one's going to come listen to me preach anymore. My whole congregation just figured out they can Netflix whatever preacher they want now. They can go hear Steve Furtick, or they can go hear Craig right. Bowles, or they can hear, you know, we, and, and I think uh, as we think about what are what are searches going to look like, like what are churches going to need in a pastor after this, that maybe is different than before this. I, I think the, the rise of emotional intelligence and uh, pastoral skill, like pastor, shepherd, priestly skill is gonna be a higher currency than it has been maybe for the last 10, 15 years where it's all about who has the best sermon. Uh, I, I could be wrong about that though. That's just editorial from William. So we're trying to figure out how do you interview for those things particularly? Uh, when when there is, isn't an ability to compete on the preaching front anymore, a anybody had to can do. I a add a, can no, I add a one concern there with the pastoral care that I think often gets overlooked is that um, I think one of the big moral failings of our society that I'm confronted with in this crisis in Iowa is the tech divide, mm. and so the virus is not the great equalizer. Like that's a terrible thing to say. And it's, it's really different for folks who don't have the tech. Right. And in our congregation, you know, we had invested in the tech stuff, but it's still the case that there are people who um, see us as their spiritual home and me as their pastor who have no way to see me other than walking up to the building and stopping by, which, which they can't do. So, you know, there's also a certain amount of sometimes I just, Uh, it's really exposing that that gap between the haves and the have-nots. And when they come back after this, you're going to have whole groups of children who had computers and were able to keep up with their schoolwork. And you're going to have whole groups of children who are already behind and are going to be more behind. Yeah, yeah we, we have uh, uh, two of our children in a, uh, private high schools. 
and then the other two that are still pre-college are in public and watching the divide in a very good public school between the two, it's it, it's not going to be an equitable deal afterward. Mm -hmm. Anybody had to do a funeral? Not yet. Not yet. We've got one. We've got one coming that we're about to do, and we have. Are you going to do that? Well, so um, we have staff only. We're doing it all virtually, and we unfortunately had to say we can't even have family there because, uh, and one of the other pastors here is doing it, but we can't even have family there because then you get into. Oh yeah, there'll just be four of us, and you go, okay, well that's four plus the three staff people, and then when you know grandma flies in or drives in or drives up or whatever, like no one wants to be the one to go. Sorry, you're at eleven, so you've got to go. So we just had to say we can't do them, but we can do them virtually. Uh, we're about to do a wedding, uh, William. You know our church a little bit. There's a we have a little prayer garden that's real pretty yeah. back here, and we're gonna have a wedding, and it's gonna be the pastor the husband and wife to be, and then I think three of their family members or something outside and they're wearing masks and stuff. And so we're yeah. having to do it. We're having to do it that way. That was in the CDC guidelines that leaked out this morning was if you're in a climate that can do outdoor church, you need to consider that for a while and have outdoor assemblies, wear yeah. masks, have ushers with gloves, all those kinds of things. And don't ever pass a plate again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, tell me, talk just for a minute about uh, giving. I mean, this is this is a horrible time. Like we at our company, I've just told our whole team that's part of growing our company: pencils down, serve, don't sell. That's our thing right now. We, but I can't imagine having to make the ask. Is giving like uh. Uh, okay, let's do it this way. Fist to five. So fist is, I have nobody giving any money at all. Five is, it's just like it was before the whole COVID thing. And you can grade anywhere in between with a one, two, three, five. So everybody on three, give me your, your best fist to five on how's your giving holding up. One, two, three. Three, four, four, five, four, five. The three and a half. Three and a half? Yeah. Okay. Does Something that mean like that. They just give half the time or? No, no. I mean, out of five, I guess I'd say like a three and a half. Yeah, we, we have, a, but we have an older congregation. And so some of them have, have their stuff in very conservative in, investments that haven't been um, quite as affected by it. And then we have some people that just work with like, um, like defense department and stuff, like they're essential. And so they're actually, they're actually doing quite well right now. And they're very generous. Yeah. Yeah. My friend who's a family lawyer, uh, which is, a dumb name for what they, it's the divorce attorney says, yeah, we're going to be really busy after all this quarantine. Uh, <laughs> so. that, but that's reality. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Some of the stuff Lillian was touching on is. I'm not hearing the giant drops in giving. Now, maybe it's churches that tend to hire us tend to have more stable giving. I don't know if that, you know, we have a bad sample size, but I'm not hearing the catastrophic numbers of oh my gosh, we're down 30%. We're having the furlough and fire. I, I, I've just not heard that yet. Um, you know, William, if I can comment, um, one, of the, one of the approaches we've taken, because I know you want to get real practical about this. Yeah. Um, we've given people the, the way you can give is you can mail it in, you can go to our website and you can do it, uh, PayPal or text to give, whatever it is. We, we make those clear and I just repeat them every week to let people yeah. know. But one of the things that, that I think has been real important, just and this is a weird conversation with people, but I've had this conversation. When they see life happening in the church, um, there's sort of a reminder. Like if you basically say, we're not, like at our church, for example, if we said, we're not doing anything, we're gonna, we're kind of throwing together services. And so we'll have kind of something for you. Um, I could see someone going, well, they're not really doing much right now. It's just kind of the gym show and he's got two musicians. And so that's not that expensive. I could see the practicality taken over. But we've really tried to say, let's do, let's do good worship services, engage more of the staff. We're doing online YouTube Bible studies. Um, I tend to try and just celebrate like our mission partners are doing these things. And so we've, we've sent money to them. We've resourced them, things like that, like people that are serving the homeless here in, in the Denver area. And so I, I like to do this anyway, but I think it's ramped up in this time as we talk just about this is what is happening I haven't had to have a single conversation about, are you guys like, are you even working right now? Like, do you still need the resources? We just show them God is moving and God's still working. It's just in a different way. And then here's quick ways, boom, boom, that you can be a part of it instead of trying to do what I think a lot of default is, is 
sort of kick into fundraising mode. I don't feel like we've done that. Okay. It, it, are any of you spending more time on the asking or making sure that people know how to give than you would in services before all this happened? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think a part of, so for your sample set, I do think it could possibly be skewed because of the circles yeah. you run in. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, renovation, our giving has been 80 plus percent online for several years. So I can tell you of other churches that are having a much harder time because maybe the population is older uh, or maybe they never made the pivot to online giving. I remember when, when we first had that conversation in a room of young Gen Xers and millennials. And they're like, nobody's got a text to give. I'll never forget having that conversation uh, with um, with our executive director at the time. And she said, this is weird. Who's gonna text to give? And I said, I promise you, people will text to give uh, when we made that pivot four years ago. And so I do think that that's a part of the data um, that's helping you, know, you see that there's not a drop off in some of your circles because the people we run with have made those pivots a long time ago. Uh, and then secondarily, just adding to, to what Jim said, I, I do think seeing life happen in the church is also important. Uh, we've taken a bit of a Macedonian approach, if, if you want to call it that, in trying to be generous out of our poverty. Uh, so when people see that we are serving the city, uh, like Lillian said, uh, buying Chromebooks for kids who we know uh, are going to get behind in school because they don't have that technology at home, uh, doing rent assistance. Uh, we, we have a feeding program out of our building right now. So our our generosity toward the community has increased uh, in this time, which I think has not only stabilized our giving, but in March, our giving was actually up uh, from from uh, where it was the month before. Wow. And, uh, and so I, I think that that's a factor, too, is when people can see that the church is being the church, uh, then I think there's a, a greater posture toward generosity. That's great. Holly, you said you got a, You shot me a message, said you had some good questions coming in. You want to throw a couple out? Yeah, well, first, I got to give a shout out to Mark Wood. He was very concerned about why Holly Tate wasn't contributing to the panel. So <laughs> I just want to say hello. <clears throat> I'm on the Vander Blumen team. Thank you, Mark, for your concern. I appreciate that. But uh, just also want to thank everybody on the panel. We have over 950 people watching this right now. And so the difference that you are making to what we and William coined this term, the normal size church. Um, is just remarkable. So William, one of the questions that we're getting is what are our panelists plan for engaging folks that are currently really engaged online and watching online? How are they going to reintegrate those folks into the physical location when that time comes? So what's the, usually it's online to offline, right? So like what's the online to offline plan when um, that can happen for churches being able to gather again in person? So William, I'll let you kind of well, Throw that yeah. out to whoever you'd like. Who, who's got something they want to say first? I'll just leave it open. I mean, I always have thoughts, but I don't want to, I don't want to keep jumping. <laughs> Matt, let's hey, Matt. hear. Yeah, it, I think it's great. I think, again, it's to, everyone has their own level of comfort. And so some people are going to be really eager to gather <laughs> and some people aren't going to be either eager to gather. So I think as, as leaders, it's being mindful in our language of what we're using in terms of hospitality being mindful of everyone's different level of comfort. Um, you know, this, this, we did not live stream before COVID-19 happened. Uh, so we are now, we sort of uh, quickly, we had the technology in place, but where we were um, in our context, you always sort of heard those whisperings of their people's level of comfort, having their likeness being like, protracted out throughout online um, so quickly you know one of the silver linings to your point uh, people don't have that fear anymore they're, they're more than happy to to have the live streaming capability so where we're at um, we're not going back I, I think in some ways the the live streaming is is a, it's certainly a powerful tool to reach members that have moved on college kids young adults um, and and also families who you know when church goes up against lacrosse tournament, I can tell you which is going to win and you know the live streaming it allows us to be able to connect with those families as well as you know folks in our context who are you know on business traveling around the world um so when people come back uh i'm not so sure that they're going to come back in the way that they 
left. Let's just say that. Yeah. Yeah. So I I'm, think I think there's a way in which like God is doing a new thing in this, right? And it's challenging a lot of our presuppositions about what counts as church. You know? And so I think if if we come out of this and all we've learned is like, oh, I can't wait to get back to the old days. And how do we get these thousands of people who are watching us online to show up in Dubuque, Iowa for worship at 930 on a Sunday? You know, surely that's not what we're meant to learn in this. I think what we're meant to learn is that, you know, it's this, it's the New Testament lesson, right? It's like, it's not about the temple. It's about being the church in exile. And what we're going to find, I think, is um, that we've got to check our own egos. If those online people want to continue to be online worshipers, let's really be careful with our language that we don't convey that that's a secondary status or somehow disappointing to us because worship is worship. Well, then, yeah, if I could jump in there, you know, um, because I had this unique experience in, in Brussels and kind of post-Christian Europe for three years, you know, I, I took this job and part of why you kind of recommended this fit here in, in Hollywood was because of this commitment, this understanding that I really believe the future of the church, the disciple making is not going to be around properties, professionals and programs. It's going to be around everyday people making disciples as they live as missionaries in the places they live, work, and play. And so we've really tried to lean into this disruption as a way to um, kind of forecast maybe what the future might actually look like. And so we, we actually have the op opportunity to go down to our building on Sunday, but rather than go back to that property, we've all been kind of live streaming in from home. We have actually involved more kind of ordinary people in our service than ever before. We've added times of contemplative prayer. We're sharing prayer requests and having people pray for them. We've got a family worship time now that families, you know, lead. Um, and we, we've had as many as 15 different faces in our service now. And we never really did that before, but um, part of it is people want to see how everyone's doing because they don't get to see and they love seeing the cat you know, roaming around. We had a dog circling and we had to edit out that eventually he decided to, you know, do his business in the middle of the worship set. And, but those moments are so authentic and real. I think you see it with late night television now is a reason why, you know, they're broadcasting from home. It feels real. But I do think that you're right, uh, Lillian, if the whole mentality is just white knuckle and bear it until we can get back into the building and do church as usual, you're actually missing the opportunity. It's so hard to disrupt an organization that has as much tradition as the church. And so when the culture disrupts it for you, you have to leverage that and begin to think, how do we want to be different at the end of this um, without disrupting everything so people feel lost, but going, you know what, let's experiment now and maybe some of these things will stay whenever we go, quote unquote, back to normal if that happens. Well, and, and that's what I'm hearing really smart people say is, you know, this is the way it was and here's the new way it is. And the future is going to be more like this than like this, <laughs> you know, it's just going to be some of each. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hearing uh, folks in normal sized churches, not just big ones, start a task force to say, all right, what are we keeping virtual and what are we not? For instance, we are never again coming up here on a night we could be home with our families for a stupid personnel meeting. Like, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're going to Zoom all finance committee meetings. We're going to, if you're in the Presbyterian Church, maybe in the Leonce, you haven't been Presbyterian long enough, but sooner or later, you're going to have a committee on committees. I promise you will. <laughs> and <laughs> they should meet virtually, you know? So it, it's... charismatic for that. <clears throat> I think that the people that I'm hearing, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. I just know if I, if I, if I set the party up, then I get on the invite list. That's how I get to be with you all. Uh, just by setting it up. But what I'm hearing is people are right now saying, where are the things that we can do so that, that we can keep and not keep? Now, confession, uh, I am a, a chronic, incurable sales guy. I mean, when I was a pastor, I was way more interested in evangelism than I was discipleship. Like I was the, like, how to get more people here? How, so I'm thinking of all these people that are coming to your churches that don't usually come. Are any of you setting up services in such a way that you're gathering their email addresses? Like, are you building a funnel to be able to do discipleship with them? Or is it just open up online and, and see what happens? And there's not a right or wrong. I'm just curious. Yeah, we, we have set up that way. You do? What is that? 
So I, I come to your online service, so I have to give my email address? You don't have to, but we ask you to. Okay. So when you land on Renovation Church Online, the first thing you see is a data collection form. Okay. And, and it is, in my opinion, it's fairly warm. It's not just to get your data, because uh, that's not the goal. The goal is to figure out how to serve you uh, right. and how to walk alongside you. And uh, it, it's a great transition question, because what I was going to say earlier is I agree with Lillian 100%. So, so I'm in a series right now called All Things New. And, uh, and I just preached Isaiah 43 last week. Uh, where God said, I'm doing a new thing. And, and I really do believe, uh, for better or for worse, I do believe that the Lord has given us an opportunity to steward this disruption to, to follow John's language. And, and I, I don't want to go back to normal because whatever normal was, wasn't working or we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, so what does tomorrow look like? And, and I think the, the phrase we've been throwing around renovation is digital integration. Uh, so how do we <clears throat> navigate a reality where, <clears throat> as Lillian said, where brick and mortar uh, and the digital reality that we're creating, uh, they take equal energy. And, and we actually put in the effort to not treat that as a second class source of engagement. We, we've had people come to faith over the last six weeks. Uh, we've had people come to faith and move into small groups over the last six weeks. We've got a guy in Brazil teaching Portuguese in a small group to help us reach the 30,000 Brazilians that live in Northwest Atlanta because it's the largest Brazilian population, uh, uh, one of the largest Brazilian populations in the nation, certainly wow. the largest one in the Southeast uh, outside of like Miami. So we are really looking at this as an opportunity to say, what reach does the digital platform give us? that brick and mortar doesn't. And how will we do multi-site going forward? You know, what is the point of, of putting $2 million or $4 million into a campus uh, if, you know, if the payout of reaching people is the same as putting $30,000 into equipment to, to uh, navigate a digital space? So all that to say, we don't require that you fill out that form, uh, but we do provide it. You can skip it by scrolling down, but it's the first thing that you see uh, and we have quite a few filled out every single week. That's how we're moving people into groups. Uh, that's how we're gauging uh, what our actual attendance is. Because you have you have screens, but you know I've got six people in my house. So how many people are actually worshiping with us? Uh, we take that form, we build the data sample set, uh, which we believe is fairly reliable, and then from that data sample set, we build a multiplier so that we can know. You know, on average, we're dealing with a 2.2 multiplier. So, you know, let's say we've got 1,500 screens on Sunday uh, at a 2.2 multiplier, you're literally looking at over 3,000 people worshiping with you in that moment. And so that's, that's what we're working on right now to, uh, to actually build a funnel to, to actually try and move people into the life of the church. Well, our church, uh, which I love our church, it's a traditional Methodist church, and they're not very good at the online service. And our pastor would say that. But they actually ask how many of you are watching. Like we fill oh. out the attendance pad, like it, oh. that we, you know, pass down that pew. Uh, you do that on the landing page, and uh, they're doing a good job of building out the the uh, nurturing of the sales funnel, for lack of a better way of putting it. Because I think, so I'm an old curmudgeon. I think people are going to come back to church. I think they're going to come to brick and mortar. I think they're going to keep gathering. I don't think that's going to go away. It might take a while oh. to get there. But I do think it's it's this it's both yeah. and, and you've got yeah, this oh, giant, coming back. giant front door that we to get I mean giant front door now and I'm so encouraged here some of y'all are actually kind of methodically thinking how do we work through that uh, Holly what other what a, what's another question you've gotten. Um, so one, I would love for, because we've had a lot of people join us since we started, if everybody could go around and just very quickly <clears> the <throat> size of their church, because there's still some concern that a lot of the ideas being talked about are for big churches. And so I'd love to just remind folks who have joined us, you know, what the attendance is. And then the other questions that we're getting the majority of are, how are you guys actually planning on doing house parties or small groups in the home with the social distancing of you know, six feet, how does that practically roll out? What does that look like? So 
those two things would be great to address before we wrap up in the next 10 minutes. I'll start, Holly. Uh, John Rittner in Hollywood, California, and we've got about 200 in attendance, um, maybe another 50 if you include kind of the, the, the children who are part of that. But um, the house party thing is one, one of the things I'm looking for a lot of direction from the state. I'm hoping that uh, if you are in a private setting and not a public setting, that there'll be an understanding or at least um, a loosening of the face mask in the six feet, especially maybe in closer <laughs> If you kind of are in relationship with these people, you you know you know they've been healthy for a longer period of time. I, I can't imagine doing a lot of house parties if you still have to do six feet, face mask, don't touch anyone. That that would be very challenging. Um, There's just less space. You might as well go to a bigger room for that. Super yeah. helpful. Uh, Leonce Crump uh, Renovation Church, eight hundred to a thousand. Uh, but to be clear, we were a church and are a church plant. So I started in my living room with two people. And, uh, and I've lived through those different phases of the church. So this isn't just big church ideology or normal sized church ideology. Um, for our, from our vantage point, very much the same as John, uh, we wanna make data driven decisions. So if a house party still means that I've gotta be gloved up and masked up, I, I, don't, really, uh, I don't really see the benefit in that. Uh, the, the, the cost benefit analysis would tell me that it, it makes more sense to continue to just worship as family units uh, until those things become more lax. And then from there, you know, we will keep groups as small as possible incrementally. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this, and, and then I'll shut up, is uh, we sold our building last fall. You knew that, William, uh, our building downtown. Uh, and they were supposed to let us lease it back. So th this is the beauty of disruption, right, and innovation. They were supposed to let us lease it back. Two days before closing, the guy who bought it said, we're not going to let you lease it back. Uh, we've already got another entity moving in. And so we had nowhere to go. Uh, and so house parties were an invention of necessity. And so we went to our small group system <clears throat> and assessed our leaders and, and you know who we had in place, who we could get in place to try and gather as many people as possible in homes until we were able to gather in a building again. And then when we got our building, which was the Cobb Energy Center, uh, there were several Sundays that we could not gather because of varying events that they were hosting there. So uh, we lost a Sunday for the BET Awards. We lost a Sunday for another concert. We, so we lost four or five Sundays since September of last year where we had to figure out a way to continue to gather around the word and around worship and in community. Uh, and so when COVID-19 hit, this was just one more ripple in the, in the iteration of our last six months. Hmm. That's great. William, we are also getting some questions about communion. How is that being handled? Yeah. I know we have a, a huge theological yeah. spectrum here on this panel, but we also have a variety of theological um, spectrum folks watching. So we'd love to hear from folks on how you're handling communion. So Jim. Well, put me in coach, put me in coach. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Lillian. All right, Lillian Daniel, a senior pastor at First Congregational Church in Dubuque, Iowa. We get about 200 folks on a Sunday, but um, an example is our Palm Sunday uh, video of the service had more than 1,500 views on YouTube. So it's a changing world. Um, uh, what I think the way the Holy Spirit's moving for me as a pastor and a leader of worship is I'm being forced to watch myself and worship as somebody else would and it's amazing how when you're doing this online, it becomes so clear what's extraneous and not necessary and what is really the heart of the matter. And so I've um, been interested in what people say they don't miss either in worship or programming. And what I'm hearing is a lot of people, they don't miss a lot of the programming, but worship has been so important to them. In particular, the teaching and the scripture. Um, in our church, we do miss our choir. We really miss them. Um, and I miss that participation of the musicians. But um, we are a tradition that celebrates communion once a month at Congregationalists. So it's not high for us, but communion has been so meaningful in this. And we have really taken it seriously. Like we told people before Palm Sunday, you know, to prepare the table at home. Good. I oh, no. it was so good. Lillian, yeah. you're breaking up and, on us. And people loved it. And with all the dilemmas, uh, with all the dilemmas of how to do communion when we get back in person, um, 
I really think we've come to sort of fall in love with communion all over again as a tradition that didn't pay that much attention to it. Well, there's, there's uh, some groups, and I think Lance is in one of those groups, that you actually weren't technically allowed to have communion in homes if there wasn't an elder there to mm. distribute it. I think, if I remember right, your stated clerk issued an opinion right before Monday Thursday saying, okay, fine, we're going to let it go. You can do it at home. But there's some that are like, can't do that, you know, uh, particularly our Roman Catholic friends and clients. Uh, now, I was encouraged to hear the Pope say that he's going to make an exception and you now, he thinks, you now, if you have sinned, you can go directly to God and ask for forgiveness through Jesus. Well, I saw that. Isn't that cool? Wow. I did a little That's an awesome idea. He, Only he promoted <laughs> Jesus. He promoted Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> We've been Jesus. doing that at our church for a long time, though. I, guess. I know. 500 we're, years we're trying to get that through, but... Uh, <laughs> Hey, William, I'll, I'll answer the communion thing. At our church, we have, um, we do it once a month, or excuse me, one service we do it every week, and one service we do it um, once a month. We do have a lot of former Catholics that are here that grew up Catholic. Um, what I'm trying to do in the worship service, so we do a couple things real practically. One is at the be when we started doing it, we were very clear to anticipate questions people have. So I, I made a comment about um, because I love having other people do it, not Jim has to touch the elements so they're particularly blessed. My job is, I think, to make sure it's um, administered properly. And then my job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So one of the beautiful things at our church is we have pastors. I actually tried to say, let's have no pastors do it and just the lay people, and, which I hate those terms. And I got, I got shouted down. But I do have it where the pastors are a little more hidden. Uh, or one of us will be up front. And then the rest is we have a ton of volunteers that do it. Now in this time, what we do is at the beginning of the, the broadcast that we have, I'll, the service, I'll say something about, we're going to be doing this later so you can start grabbing elements. I've made a comment about um, throughout church history, what we've done, my other pastor gave me this language actually, throughout church history, they've used whatever elements are available to them. And so please do that today with a clear conscience. Like, we don't use unleavened bread and wine, even in the worship service. We use regular bread and grape juice in our worship service. We even have gluten-free. So I try to just address any questions if someone's going, no, it's got to be by a pastor. It's got to be bread. It's got to be grape juice or whatever it is to try and alleviate that. And then we, we tell people at the service, here's a time to take it if you'd like to take it. And then our verbiage is... I gave, I gave the people that do it filters and I named some people of this, this is going to be a, a widow who's sitting there by herself. And then the, the guy with four little kids. Um, so as you, as you walk people through how to do it, have both of them in mind. So if you say, get up now and have this time, then the poor widow is there with the reminder that she's there by herself. Um, or if you just focus on them, then it doesn't translate to the family. So we've really had to think of who are the people taking this, but we we're doing it every week offering it every week i'd say and then we have a song play during it so yeah. if people want to take it they can if not they can kind of kick back and and just listen to the music if they yeah. rather do that one of the uh one of the benefits of being a recovering pastor is i still have my uh sacrament kit that i'd take to the hospital so that was us on monday thursday oh. wow and, and the awesome. little the little if you see the cup here this is so cool lillian would know this uh those were the communion cups for uh, Princeton Seminary's chapel service. So the 500 little sterling silver ones, the new chaplain- You stole that when you were in seminary? No, 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 it's better, it's better than that, I mean, It's better, the story's even better. I, I, my work study at one of several jobs I had to put myself through school was uh, working in the archives. And uh, so when the new chaplain arrived, he wanted uh, plexiglass that he didn't have to clean or maintain. So he threw away 500 sterling so And the archivist is friends with the janitors because he's a gossip and they, have, they know everything about what's really going on. So they brought us a trash bag full of 500 of them and he kept them and he gives them to his students for graduation gifts. So amazing. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. awesome. That's amazing. There's a big lesson in there somewhere about not throwing everything old out in the middle of the disruption. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, we, we do need to close up time. We told people one hour. You guys have been gracious. But uh, I'll, I'll just close with a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, if you're watching now, if you go to reopeningchurch.com, you'll, you'll see this 
in available in replay. You'll see a large church one. I think uh, Thursday, we're having one just for children's ministry, and we're having children's pastors from great big churches and normal sized churches, and even the director of all children's ministry for Lifeway. So, so we get some really practical advice on what do we do with kids going forward, and I think that'll be helpful. Uh, but, but I'm just wondering, you guys, have you thought through, I know some of you have a very small staff, some of you have a mid-sized staff, are there going to be different roles on staff going forward for you guys? I mean, what what do you think about that? Like, I think the communication director is going to be on senior staff now. So uh, my communication, my, my screen lit up because my kids are talking behind me. Uh, my communication director was already on senior staff. Okay. Interestingly enough. And uh, we have had some shifts already uh, and some pivots and roles already that I suspect will be lasting on the other side of this. Yeah, I, I think that we really need to think about staff in terms of like, you know, people that are more utility players and five tool players. Yes. This is a time when our jobs are different. And as a leadership team, we've made the decision that we are not going to furlough anyone. We're going to continue to pay everyone. Um, but we realize that jobs are different. And so we're sort of asking different things. We're asking people to step up. And I mean, you mentioned the archives, uh, you know, we're, Last week, uh, I, I spent two days and cleaned out the archives room because yeah. it's just it's a it's a project, right? It's these kinds of like things that, you know, you, you do if you had the time to do. Well, now we sort of our time is different and we can sort of still be productive and and sort of take on some of those uh, projects. Um, and we're asking staff to come alongside and, and change their roles a little bit as well. William, yeah. I, also, I also think there's a lot of local church collaboration that can take place. We have a pastor who live streams video games. It's part of his background. He uh, was a voiceover actor and did video games. And so um, he had a Twitch stream and he had all the technology. So he was able to get us up and running within a week in a very creative way. As I talked to others who weren't able to, they kind of just came into the fold and we actually bring them into our service. We are now three, serve, three different communities that collaborate for our Sunday service. Um, and we take turns playing the different pastoral roles and teaching. And so it's been a gift to their community to be able to have this technology, but it's been a huge gift to our team to have extra staff kind of come in. Um, and it's made us feel like more of a citywide kind of movement. And so I think there's opportunities to look for people around you and think about kind of more partnerships as well. Well, I, I, would, I want everybody is, to I mean, I was gonna say, this is no time for hothouse flowers or divas in ministry. You know, I think <laughs> flexibility and agility, this is what we need. We need people with a sense of humor. And I mean that any job in the church is ministry, whether you have a collar, you're ordained or not. So when you said communications director, my response is what communication director? You know, we don't have one. We have an outstanding administrator who has now become a videographer and producer and director, you know, <laughs> and, and also does a lot of our marketing. And so, you know, we're going to come out of this, I think, with a real appreciation for the folks who have a spirit of adventure and are willing to get down and make sandwiches if that's what needed or give the sermon. And I think a lot of people who don't have that disposition are gonna think twice about going into ministry. And that's probably okay. Well, I think they're also gonna be the people who are gonna be the first ones that do get furloughed or cut when it comes to that for churches. Well, I mean, that is that is a reality. I mean, 100% because yeah. uh, this has really challenged hiring dynamics, I think for all of us. To, to I, I am, I'm a little bit aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you all. Uh, everybody that's listening, go to Ecclesia Hollywood, go to the Church of Bronxville, go to Rockland or whatever field Jim's sitting in. Uh, <laughs> you, and Lillian, you've got a new book out, right? Yeah, tired of apologizing for a church I don't belong to. Okay, there you go. Awesome. And, uh, and, and then everybody go to Leonce's Church which will not be open in Georgia uh, anytime real soon, but will be online. So th hey, thank you all so much for making time. I know you've got people to take care of and to take time to, to, to talk to us is great, but I don't think you have any idea the impact it'll make in somebody sitting out there that's really trying to figure out a roadmap and you've given them at least one good idea today. So thanks so much. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thanks everybody. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us Bye -bye. and we'll see you again soon.